WCW NWO Spring Stampede 98 took place on April 19th inside the Denver Coliseum in Denver, Colorado. The 83 week Monday Night War win streak just ended on the Monday before this pay per view. The WWF had beaten WCW in the TV ratings, so World Championship Wrestling go into this pay per view knowing that the competition's coming on strong. Tonight, Sting defends his WCW Heavyweight Championship against Macho Man Randy Savage. We learn from Mike Tanay that that match is a no DQ main event at the beginning of the show, DDP defends his US title against Raven, and we have a special bat match pitting Hollywood Hogan and Kevin Nash against Roddy Piper and The Giant. We've got 7,500 fans inside the arena and a quarter million people watching at home on pay per view, down significantly from Uncensored. Let's see how WCW started things off with our opening match, it's Perry Saturn vs Goldberg. Physicality between Goldberg and Saturn has been kept to a minimum in the run up to this match, though it has been teased quite a lot. Goldberg's been destroying flock members on his Road to Spring Stampede, and it's kinda reminiscent of Chris Benoit's Road to Starcade 1997 when he was scheduled to face Raven. Mike Tanay says Goldberg is 73 0 heading into this match. Since the last episode of Reliving the War, Goldberg gave Van Hammer another beating during the WCW Saturday night tapings on the 14th. However, this match did not air. He also also defeated Barry Darso on Thunder and that match did make the air, so Goldberg's actually 67-0 heading into Spring Stampede. Win or lose though, Goldberg's getting a shot at the US title tomorrow night on Nitro. He starts off by suplexing Saturn from the abdominal stretch position, he then delivers a modified overhead belly to belly suplex before applying a knee bar, and Smackhead Kidman has to help his fellow flock member out here which was a big mistake. Look at how Goldberg just throws Kidman on top of Saturn. Old Billy Boy didn't give a damn, did he? Saturn gets back in by jumping over Goldberg's back, though his follow up kick doesn't do much damage. His sweep does bring Goldberg down to the mat, though, and Perry follows this up with a smooth springboard leg drop and a middle rope elbow drop. Perry then tries a suplex, but Goldberg counters with a snap swinging neckbreaker, or the chainsaw as it was called for a while in WCW. Goldberg then performs a gorilla press front par slam, and once again, Kidman helps Saturn out by bang Perry a bit of time. Saturn's able to perform a vaulting splash from the apron, followed by an Exploder suplex and a super kick. Bill gets sent to the outside following a knee to the back, and Perry then traps Goldberg's arm between the ring post and the steel steps. Goldberg tries to shake the pain off as Saturn goes for a middle rope springboard move, but it's botched pretty badly. It's a shame too because this one was going so well up until this point. Still, back in the ring, Goldberg continues to sail and Perry pulls off a top rope wheel kick. It goes to the mat where Goldberg finds himself in an arm bar. Perry then applies a cross arm breaker and he moves into a front chancery after getting kicked in the face. But Goldberg picks Saturn up and Perry gets drilled into the corner. Goldberg lands a standing sidekick followed by a clothesline, Goldberg lines up the spear, Perry gets nailed, and just when Goldberg was about to hit the jackhammer, Kidman distracts the referee and Perry gets in a low blow. Saturn tries a top rope attack but Goldberg counters with a military press slam, this looked awesome. He then has to fight off flock members and poor smackhead Kidman takes more punishment after a devastating spear. The distraction allows Saturn to lock in the rings of Saturn but Goldberg stands up while in the move and we see an incredible display of strength when Goldberg transitions into that jackhammer. This match was a bit shaky in places, especially that springboard botch to the outside, but still, without a doubt, this was Goldberg's best match in WCW to date. He's gonna face either DDP or Raven tomorrow night on Nitro for the US belt, so it'll be interesting to see if he can get the job done against one of the bigger players in WCW. This victory means Goldberg is now legitimately 68-0. Chavo Guerrero vs Ultimo Dragon took place next and this is a match we already saw on Nitro a few weeks prior. The premise of the match is the exact same too, with Eddie Guerrero wanting his nephew to make the Guerrero family proud, almost to the point where it comes across like Eddie's bullying Chavo. Chavo took the Ultimo Dragon kick combo and Eddie was so embarrassed that he hit his face under a towel. Chavo tried to show Uncle Eddie that he was awesome by pulling off a bridging inverted Indian deathlock but unless it's winning matches then Eddie doesn't care. Chavo pulls off a chin lock, and for those not watching Reliving the War, Chavito is so close to overtaking the British Bulldog as the Monday Night Chin Lock Master, so let's see if he hits the magic number at Spring Stampede. 
Chavo body slams Dragon, he delivers an elbow drop, and there's chin lock number two. He moves into a head scissors, but Dragon says fuck this, and he locks in a modified camel clutch chin lock variant just to show Chavo that he means serious business. The submission holds continue with a surfboard from Dragon, and Eddie's losing his mind at this point. Dragon tries a Mahistral cradle, Chavo kicks out, and he takes Dragon out with a clothesline. Dragon performs a smooth counter from a backdrop before delivering a hurricane rana, but Chavo stays in it by countering the cover. Chavo gets his nuts smashed on the top turnbuckle, though he manages to fight off a Dragon Steiner attempt, but he gets stumped to the outside following a suplex counter, and we then see the Asai moonsault. Eddie screams at Chavo to get up and win because if he doesn't, Eddie's going to get a lot tougher on his nephew following this match. Chavo has to get the victory. Chavo gets up and he tries a corkscrew dive from the ring to the outside and he just overshoots his target, you can't take anything away from him though. Back in the ring, the men go down when they both go for lariats, Dragon gets up and he goes for a top rope move but Chavo counters with a low blow and Chavo unintentionally hits Dragon right in his ultimo balls. The referee wants Chavo to back up, but Eddie's screaming at his nephew to take advantage and go for the kill. Eddie's absolutely furious, he slaps Chavo a few times and Chavo does eventually go on offense, but he wasted way too much time here. Eddie's embarrassed again and it all goes back over his head. Chavo performs a brain buster, he points at Eddie and he says that one was for you but he's still wasting way too much time. Chavo goes for the corner tornado DDT, dragon counters with the dragon sleeper and Chavo gives it up. Once again, the Guerrero family has been embarrassed and Eddie isn't happy. Eddie gets on his knees and he begs Chavo to tell him what he has to do to make him win. Chavo tells Eddie he won't cheat to get victories and Eddie tells his nephew to get a grip. This loss means Eddie's going to turn up the heat though from this point on. Life's about to get a lot harder for Chavo Guerrero Jr. The next match is one I've been looking forward to watching again, it's Chris Benoit vs Booker T. These two have had a few time limit draws on Nitro, and Benoit feels like he should be the TV champion, but Booker is played by WCW rules and no matter what Benoit says, Booker's title defenses have all been above board. Tonight though, the TV title limit has been removed, there has to be a winner. We get another tense stare down between the competitors followed by a good strong lockup that has to get forcefully broken up by the referee. Booker then delivers a stiff shoulder block and Benoit has to roll out of the ring afterwards to get his wits about him. Booker lets Benoit get back inside the ropes, the challenger ducks a spinning back kick and the champion goes down after a sweep. Chris then drills Booker's leg into the canvas but he tries this one too many times and Benoit ends up taking that back kick. Again, Chris goes to the outside to rethink his strategy and Booker invites him to get back in. The two go back at it, a few hip toss counters leads to Benoit taking a clothesline, and Booker brings it down to the mat while focusing on the arm. Benoit tries to fight back and he ends up taking a hook kick. Booker focuses again on the arm but this time Benoit brings Booker to the corner and Chris lays the boots in. Still, Chris can't get started here, he gets a boot up in the opposite corner but he pays for it by taking a backbreaker. He wakes up a little though and he finally starts doing some things that are substantial when he performs a front suplex and Booker gets dropped on the top rope. Chris then knocks Booker off the apron and now Benoit's gonna go fully in control. Benoit performs a snap suplex when it gets back in the ring. He drives his knee into Booker's back while giving that chin a good old saying too. He counters a Booker T double axe handle with a drop toe hold. He then performs a back suplex and there it is, the diving headbutt. Benoit wastes way too much time before making the cover and Booker ends up getting a foot on the ropes. The extended the recovery time allows Booker to counter a suplex with a suplex of his own, but Benoit makes Booker pay with a hard back elbow. As Chris hits a snap suplex, Tony Schiavone says we have passed the usual 10 minute TV title mark. Booker takes a backbreaker and Chris follows this up with his rolling German suplexes. Booker T's getting absolutely destroyed at this point and the fans are cheering for Chris. The onslaught continues with an insane back suplex from the top rope. If you watch that again in slow motion, you can see both guys smacking the back of their heads on the canvas and indeed Benoit sells it just as much as Booker T. Benoit crawls to Booker to make the cover but Booker 
Booker kicks out. They've got the crowd in the palm of their hands here as Booker gets a burst of adrenaline and he performs a spine buster. You can hear the contact when Booker performs his jumping forearm and this gets followed up with a flopjack and a spinaroonie. The crowd are absolutely pumped up at this point. Booker goes for the axe kick but Benoit pulls the referee in and Mickey J takes all the impact. Booker checks on the ref, Benoit catches him with a cross face. The champion taps out but there's no referee to call it. Benoit goes to wake the referee up and Booker T jumps over Mickey J to perform a Hardem sidekick. The referee is able to make the count and Booker T wins a fantastic match at Spring Stampede. A replay shows us that Benoit definitely pulled the referee in for that X kick so Chris screwed himself over in this one. But there's enough here to continue the rivalry and I'm absolutely all for it. These two worked extremely well with each other and they are yet to have a bad match on TV together. The British Bulldog vs Kurt Hennig is up next. Hennig and Rick Rude have gotten the better of Bulldog and Jim Neidhart by handcuffing them to the ropes and forcing Bret Hart to miss his lunch break in order to save his brothers in law. So this time Jim Neidhart's going to get handcuffed to Rick Rude and this should lead to no foul play at Spring Stampede. <laughs> yeah right. One of Denver's finest, the Tony Schiavone calls one of Detroit's finest, puts the handcuffs on Rude and Neidhart. The anvil laughs like an absolute maniac as he and Rude get cuffed. For Jimbo, this was just like any old Sunday night. Right. Davey goes on the attack straight away and the match quickly goes to the outside. Rude tries to go after Bulldog but Jim pulls him back. You may notice that Hennig's wearing a knee brace tonight. When it gets back in the ring he throws a knee into Davey but that was a big mistake. Davey begins focusing all his efforts on the injured body part and Bobby Heenan talks a lot of sense when he says it's smart for wrestlers to go after their opponents weak points like this. Kurt tries to fight back but Davey keeps the pressure on with punches and kicks and this ladies and gentlemen is the entire match. There are no slams, no suplexes or anything that involves one guy lifting the other to cause damage. You get a Davy boy knee lock that Rude tries to break up but that's about it. And this made me curious, maybe Kurt really was injured? I looked this up and yeah he wrestles a 2 minute match against Chris Benoit the following night on Nitro and then he takes a few months off. Turns out this knee injury was completely legit so you gotta give it a pass. Davey goes to put on a sharpshooter but on the outside Jim Neidhart's grabbed Denver's finest and things are heating up on the outside. Why did Jim suddenly snap? Did the cop find something in Jimbo's pockets? Well it turns out there was a little switcheroo and that's no cop my friends, that's Vincent. I like how the anvil lets Rude free himself and cuff Jim to the ring post while Jim remains completely oblivious, it doesn't even happen that quickly. Kurt wins the match by uh, hitting Davey's head on the ring post. Rude gets in the ring to attack Davey while Jim tries to fight off Vincent. The numbers are too much though and the NWO destroy Bulldog and Jim with a nightstick. For weeks leading up to this match, Bret Hart would come down and save these two. He made a point of saying he won't let these kind of gang attacks happen on his watch. At Spring Stampede though, Bret must have got a little fed up because he lets these two bozos get their asses kicked. A terrible match here but again, you've got a guy working with an injury. Chris Jericho defended his cruiserweight title against Prince Ikea next. Jericho's got a microphone in his hand and he says, I want you to want me before dedicating this match to Dean Malenko, a man who can currently be found in the where are they now file. Jericho says Dean can sit at home, eat potato chips and drink coca cola while living vicariously through Chris, the man of a thousand and four holds. The prince out wrestles the champ at the beginning of the match. The commentators are talking about the issues within the NWO here instead of focusing on the bout. Anytime Jericho gets the upper hand, the prince answers back immediately and one of the better early spots was when Jericho took a drop kick while skinning the cat. Ikea then pulls off a somersault senton before getting back in the ring and Ikea brings it down to the mat with a side headlock. Chris gets up and he manages to pull off a drop to a hold that sends Prince into the middle rope. He pulls off a vertical suplex and Jericho then applies a chin lock. The crowd's pretty much silent here and there is a real lack of investment. Ikea gets body slammed, Jericho showboats with his crazy strut, Chris then goes upstairs but the prince gets a boot up and these kind of spots always take me out of a match. I mean if the prince didn't get a foot up, what kind of aerial attack could Chris perform while his body stayed vertical while in the air? It's a nitpick I know but it happens so often. Prince Ikea pulls off a nice fireman's carry slam next, he somersaults from a springboard attack but he only gets a two 
two count. The Prince goes up for a victory roll, but Chris counters with a lion tamer, and now the crowd makes some noise. Ikea makes it to the ropes while Lynn Jericho's finisher, and the match continues. Chris overshoots slightly on a diving sunset flip. Ikea performs a back elbow before heading to the top. Chris stops the aerial attack and he goes for a super Frankensteiner, but Ikea fights back and both men go tumbling to the outside. Back in the ring, Jericho counters again into a land tamer. The Prince reverses with a pin attempt, and yeah, the crowd are much more into it now, and it makes the match a whole lot better. Unfortunately, though, they were a little too late because the match is now pretty much over. Jericho performs a float over, but he gets caught out with a Northern Light suplex. Chris gets a hand on the bottom rope here. Prince fights Chris off in the corner, and he goes for a diving sunset flip, twisting his body in midair to position it correctly. But Chris rolls through, and the land tamer gets applied for the final time. Jericho drags drives his knee into Ikea's neck and the challenger tops out. This one definitely got better as it progressed and I was expecting to dislike it but it turned out pretty good. Not one I'd recommend you seek out but I wouldn't skip it either if you plan on watching this pay per view from start to end. Buff Bagwell and Scott Steiner are scheduled to take on Lex Luger and Rick Steiner, but it looks like Buff Daddy's got a wrist injury. Buff and Scott get in the ring and Bagwell says the tag team match has been cancelled. Buff's got a terrible injury, and even though he and Scott are dressed to wrestle, Bagwell got advice from his lawyer before stepping through the curtain. Do not wrestle this match. James J. Bebe Dillon and Mean Gene Ogerland come down to the ring as Scott shows Buff's sympathy while also stating he was ready to take out his brother tonight. Buff tells Dillon that he needs a doctor's release to wrestle, and Buff doesn't have one. Dylan, however, has flown a doctor in for Randy Savage tonight to ensure the Macho Man was good to go in his main event match. That doctor will have no issues checking Buff over and, if applicable, Buff can get that release so he can wrestle tonight. This is all news that Bagwell and Steiner don't want to hear. The doctor does a run-in, he begins taking off the bandage and Bagwell ends up grabbing JJ by the tie. The referee says there's fuck all wrong with Buff Daddy so the match is gonna take place. Rick and Lex come down and Rick immediately goes for Scott. Buff stops the dog face gremlin but he gets paid back in kindly with Rick's scoop power slam. Brother Scott comes back in and he attacks while Rick's back's turned. Scott then gets tagged in and he tries to choke Rick on the middle rope. Scott loses his footing a little when hitting Rick with a clothesline and Scott then tags out before Rick can build a comeback. Buff sells the wrist after pulling off a body slam. Scott comes in and he delivers a power slam and an elbow drop. The quick tags continue with Buff taking it down to the mat and Scott does the exact same thing when he comes back in. This isn't how fans wanted to see Rick Steiner vs Scott Steiner. This needed to be a singles match and you'd expect that singles match to feature hard clotheslines and stiff suplexes but instead we get this tag team match built around a Lex Luger hot tag. Rick gets the chance to tag out after planting buff to the mat. Scott tries to intervene but the tag's made and Lex floors the NWO guys with multiple clotheslines. Buff takes the forearm shot, Lex signals for the rack but Scott Steiner interrupts and buff gets saved, for now. Scott holds Luger so buff can get in a free shot but Bagwell gets rocked with a Steiner line and at the moment Rick and Scott stand face to face, Big Papa Pump does a runner and he leaves Bagwell all alone. Rick stops a blockbuster attempt by shoving Buff Daddy, Lex applies the rack and the WCW guys win at Spring Stampede. Bagwell and Steiner hamming it up before the bout was entertaining but this match could have been on Nitro. A match on Thunder featuring Luger and Rick taking on Buff and Scott Norton turns out to be way more interesting for all the wrong reasons but we'll talk about all that soon on Reliving the War. As a matter of fact, I might have to bring someone in to talk about that match. Psychosis vs Lepark is our next match and there's practically no story here except Leparka likes hitting fools with steel chairs and Psychosis was one of those fools. This bout was unadvertised, it's a bonus bout at Spring Stampede. The two slapped the shit out of each other just after the opening bell and Psychosis showed off his agility with a smooth diving Hurricane Rana. He kept the pressure on with a dive over the top rope to the outside and Leparka showed off his high flying skills with an Arabian press moonsault. After dropping Leparka on the top rope and smashing his little balls into a million tiny pieces, Psychosis pulled off a top rope Frankensteiner and he followed this up with a twisting moonsault to the outside. Legitimately dangerous and high risk maneuvers that the audience just didn't care for. Psychosis misses a top rope splash and Leparka makes Psychosis pay with a big old Alabama slam. Leparka then breaks up his own cover to dish out more damage but of course that was a mistake. Psychosis drop kicks the middle rope while Leparka was celebrating and it ends with Psychosis performing the guillotine leg drop while Leparka waited 
on the ropes. A pretty standard WCW Lucha match which meant there was a lot of work put in but at the same time the two didn't have much heat at Spring Stampede. It's time for the bat match, Kevin Nash and Hulk Hogan vs Roddy Piper in the Giant. The big story in this one is the lack of trust shared between Nash and Hollywood. Hogan's had trust issues with Randy Savage dating all the way back to January but Big Kev backed up Macho a few times and that created issues between two founding fathers of the NWO. Nash told Hogan to watch his back, there's others in the NWO who aren't happy with Hollywood's leadership. He wanted to know why his buddy Six was fired and he wanted to know why Scott Hall wasn't on TV anymore. Hogan said that Sean Waltman couldn't cut the mustard and he had no idea where Scott was. Was, but in reality, Scott was in rehab. So things are tense within the NWO and after tonight big changes happen within the groundbreaking faction that have huge ramifications moving forward. The bat match was created by Roddy Piper, there's a bat placed on a pole and whoever retrieves it can use it legally. WCW just loved those oversized poles, didn't they? You can see Nash complain about it when he gets in the ring, and he even says to Hulk, hey, you better climb that fucking thing because I'm certainly not doing it. Fair dues to Roddy Piper though, the hot rod tries to climb the pole the minute the bell rings and Hulk Hogan has to stop Piper because, remember, Nash certainly isn't gonna do it. Piper gets his head rocked on the pole and Hogan lays in the punches. Roddy gets hung up in the tree of woe and Hulk gets in a few kicks, and then Big Sexy gets tagged in. Kev doesn't do a lot here, he grabs Piper in a waist lock and he brings him back over to Hogan for a free shot. Hollywood tags back in and Piper starts no selling, Hogan takes a few rights and lefts before getting poked in the eye, and Hollywood finds himself in the wrong corner for a moment. Piper starts pulling out Hogan's hair and Heenan says well that won't take too long and you know what, say what you want about this match but the crowd are making a lot of noise here. A headbutt sends both Piper and Hogan to the mat but it's Hogan who gets up first and he uses his weight belt to whip Piper's back. Every Hogan and Piper encounter plays out the exact same way in WCW. Hogan then goes for the bat and he waits for the giant to grab him before climbing the pole. The giant uses the weight belt to smack Hogan's ass and again, the crowd like it. I mean, they like the weapon, not Hogan's ass. The eroticism continues when Hulk gets put over the giant's knee for a good old fashioned spanking but Nash breaks it up. Piper gives Big Sexy a whipping too and the NWO get out of the ring to ponder what the hell's going on. Hogan thinks rubbing against the apron will fix his ass but he takes another whipping. The commentators are surprised Hogan and Nash are working so well together here but we have a lot more of this match to get through. Piper gets his little hot rod smashed with a low blow and Kevin Nash gets tagged in. He tells Roddy to tag in the giant, the crowd gets all fired up and here we go, Jan vs Nash once again. Jan doesn't take too kindly to Nash pie facing him and Big Sexy takes some punishment in the corner including a hard slap across the chest. Nash gets a boot up in the opposite corner and this leads to the usual Nash offense with knee strikes, back elbows and chokes. Piper inadvertently distracts the referee and this allows Hogan to choke out the big man. The Jan takes a clothesline from Kevin, he gets himself right back up and then the two big men wipe each other out with big boots. I thought this spot was great. Piper and Hogan tag in and they share punches, Piper floors Hogan after winding up a big right, Hogan takes a clothesline, a ton of punches in the corner and another eye rake and Big Nash has had enough. He gets in to help Hulk but he takes a low blow, the Jan pulls off a drop kick and Nash tumbles out of the ring, this gets a great pop too and Piper then applies a sleeper on Hulk that eventually puts him on the mat. Piper goes for the bat, Jan gets up there too to help the hot rod out, Piper retrieves the bat but Nash and Hogan then wake up and the baby faces get taken out. Hogan throws the bat away and this confuses the commentators but Hulk had a plan all along. The NWO booty man shows up and he's holding another bat just for Hollywood Hogan. Hulk gets the bat, he whacks the Jan from behind, he then lines up a shot for Piper but he ends up nailing Nash and this is when the match breaks down. Piper chases Hogan out of the ring, Hollywood gets back inside while Piper has his back turned to the booty man, booty man grabs Roddy's bat and he passes Hulk the other bat that was on the pole. Hogan smacks Piper across the back and Hogan wins the match for the NWO. But Hollywood now has a big problem, Kevin Nash takes the straps down and it looks like he wants to fight Hogan. He decides instead to go for a power bomb on the giant after Hogan convinces him to do so, but Hollywood backstabs the giant killer when he hits him with the baseball bat. 
The giant screams at Hogan, Hulk gets out of the ring, the big man breaks the bat over his knee, and that's how it ended folks. The NWO is now truly broken and things will never be the same again. I've watched this match a few times because it's came up a few times for wrestling bios videos and it's not as awful as what people make it out to be. Given the guys in the ring and given the limitations they all share in one way or another, it's still pretty entertaining. It's not great or anything, but it's not terrible either, and the crowd in the arena absolutely loved it. Raven vs Diamond Dallas Page for the United States Championship is up next. This one, as usual, will be contested under Raven's rules. Raven blames DDP for a lot of his hardships in later life. Scotty Flamingo and DDP were good friends in WCW years ago, but Flamingo left and he fell on hard times. He had to go to ECW and spend his time taking part in extreme matches because Dallas wouldn't put in a good word for him in WCW, so Raven wants DDP to feel his pain. He blames DDP for everything. He stole the US Championship belt on page to prove a point, but tonight he gets a chance to win it for real. The flock sits at ringside for this one. DDP makes his entrance first and immediately Raven's cronies get involved. DDP moves out of the way and Raven smacks Sick Boy with the US belt. DDP shoves the belt in Raven's face and Dallas is all fired up as he throws Raven into the corner before delivering a back suplex. It spills to the outside where DDP performs a plancha on Sick Boy and Raven, and Paige has to stop an even flow attempt back inside the ropes by running Raven into the corner. There's a lot of noise inside the arena as Paige pulls off a swinging neckbreaker. Dallas then goes for the cutter but Raven gets out of the ring and he starts heading back up the rampway. Paige follows the challenger and the two are gonna fight while using some props that are used at the entrance set. Raven gets pulled off a stagecoach and Mark Curtis takes a bump on the hay too. Dallas then climbs up to the top and he dives off the stagecoach and the crowd goes crazy. Raven gets thrown into a fence set up at the entranceway and Paige uses a trash can nearby to do more damage. Raven takes another bump into the fencing and again Dallas is all fired up tonight. DDP then sets Raven up for a suplex and listen to Tony Schiavone here. He's gonna suplex him where? On the website! Yeah, Raven just got suplexed onto a website, a night of firsts here at Spring Stampede. Raven kicks DDP away and Dallas falls into the backdrop behind the table. DDP then gets a tray broken over his head. The gimmicked VIP table breaks under Dallas's weight and the one beside it, the one that isn't gimmicked, of course doesn't break. The two leave the tables and Raven uses a bull rope on Dallas before also using that trash can. Page then gets dragged back to the ring with the bull rope around his neck and yeah, this has been a great fight so far and a solid change of pace for this pay per view. Back in the ring, Sick Boy hands Raven the perverse kitchen sink and Dallas takes another shot. Paige then gets choked again with the rope and DDP's cell job here I thought was great. There's a sense of panic while he fights back but he gets to his feet and he manages to pull off a drop toe hold that sends Raven into that kitchen sink. Paige thinks he's done enough to score the victory but here comes Kidman with a splash. Paige moves out of the way and Kidman gets taken out but this exchange buys Raven a little time and he kicks out of Paige's cover. Sick Boy hits Paige with a crutch but DDP kicks out of Raven's cover. Van Hammer gets on the top rope and just like Kidman he messes up and he takes out Raven. Dallas takes out Van Hammer with the kitchen sink but again Raven kicks out of the follow up cover and Bobby Heenan wonders how much these two can take. Raven delivers a low blow and he calls in Big Reese. DDP takes a double handed choke slam and still Paige stays in it. Lodi's next to lend a hand. Lodi tosses a stop sign to Raven but the plan backfires when Paige shoves it in Raven's face and Dallas then begins taking out interfering flock members. He does well here, even hitting Kidman with a diamond cutter, but then some random dude we haven't seen before hits DDP with that stop sign and this sets Paige up nicely for the even flow. Raven covers DDP and we've got a new United States champion. We get a look at this guy who interfered. Shivani says he was there earlier pulling cables and acting like a crew member. Turns out that it's Horace Hogan ladies and gentlemen and I don't know guys. Everyone complains about the NWO getting too many members and yeah the flock had less but the flock's just filling up with lower mid card guys at this point and it feels unnecessary. Take nothing away from the match though, this was a great fight for the US title and a highlight of Spring Stampede 1998. Fans aren't happy that Raven just won the belt but Raven's got a huge task ahead of him when he defends that US champ championship against Bill Goldberg tomorrow night on Nitro. Main event time, world champion Sting vs Macho Man Randy Savage. 
Savage's storyline up until this point hasn't really involved the Stinger. He's been having ongoing issues with Hulk Hogan as mentioned earlier during the bat match. This main event got booked after Macho attacked Sting when the icon tried to help him back in the uncensored main event cage match, but all that is really an afterthought in terms of the overall story WCW is trying to tell here. Randy Savage made it clear that he went rogue because he wants to take over the NWO. Like Kevin Nash, the Macho Man has called Hogan's leadership into question, and Savage also let Hogan know that there's guys in the faction who aren't very happy with Hogan leading the way. If the Macho Man wins the World Championship tonight, then he might just be one step closer to overthrowing Hulk, and maybe those guys who aren't happy with Hogan will see the light and follow Macho Man's lead. Savage was attacked at the beginning of Monday Nitro two weeks ago and the blame was placed on Hulk Hogan in the NWO. In storyline, he's going into this one not at 100% and he's got a tough opponent on the other side of the ring tonight, the man called Sting. The men make their entrances, and remember, this is a no disqualification match. Randy goes on offense as soon as Sting steps inside the ropes and it spills to the outside briefly where Macho hits Sting's head on the guardrail. Back in the ring, Macho chokes Sting and he brings the champ to the corner, and Randy sells the arm when he punches his opponent. He got this injury after that NWO attack on the Miami Nitro two weeks ago. Sting fights back and Macho gets floored. It goes back to the outside for more guardrail shots and just like Raven earlier, the Macho Man decides to walk away from the match, his arms in too much pain. Again, like the Raven match, Sting gives chase and the wooden fence comes into play on more than one occasion. Macho takes quite a few bumps here and I think this would have been way more effective if the spot wasn't already done in the previous match. Savage gets dropped on the fence and Sting decides to use a bale of hay on the Macho Man. The two make it back down the ringside where Macho gets set up for a stinger splash at the guardrail and Sting isn't too successful with this variation is he? 9 times out of 10 he's gonna miss it. Macho brings it back to the ring and he only gets a 2 count when using the ropes for leverage. A pile driver gets countered with a backdrop but Sting's follow up elbow drop misses the mark. It isn't long before the match once again goes to the outside and Sting ends up suplexing the Macho Man on the floor. Sting's feeling pretty confident now, he waits for Savage to get back in the ring but Macho comes back with a low blow. The little stinger abuse continues when Savage drops Sting on the top rope but still this isn't enough to end the match. Sting counters a top rope double axe handle and Sting gets Savage in position for a stinger splash. Randy pulls Charles Robinson in for the bump, Sting stops just before impact but then Savage hits a clothesline and the ref then takes a hit. Sting takes a pile driver and Randy thinks it's time for the elbow drop but Sting wakes up and Macho now has a problem. So, Liz jumps in, she hits the stinger with a chair from behind. Randy tries to capitalize but he ends up in the corner along with Elizabeth. He then sacrifices Liz when Sting goes for the splash and then Sting gets wiped out with a chair shot. Macho has it won, he goes to the top rope for the elbow drop but that bastard Hulk Hogan shows up and Randy gets pushed off the top rope. Still, Macho gets up and he tries to suplex Sting but it gets countered. Sting performs his scorpion death drop but there's no one here to count to three. Kevin Nash then makes an appearance, he hits the stinger from behind, he then pulls off the outlaw jackknife powerbomb and stings out cold. Nash picks up the referee by his shirt and he throws him over to count the pinfall and we now have a new WCW World Heavyweight Champion. Macho Man Randy Savage has defeated Sting at Spring Stampede 1998. Nash tells the referee to present Savage with the world belt but Savage is absolutely out of it. Hollywood Hogan and the Booty Man show up at the entrance way and Hogan says this is out of order. That's Hogan's belt, not Savage's. The disciple has no idea where he is but he plays along anyway. And that's how Spring Stampede ends, the balance of power within the NWO is now completely messed up and Hogan's no longer the top dog of his own faction. Gonna sound like a broken record here, but Spring Stampede had its moments. The Benoit vs Booker T and Raven vs DDP matches were the highlights as expected. Saturn vs Goldberg and Ikea vs Jericho were better than I anticipated. 
The tag team bat match wasn't absolutely terrible, no matter what you may read. In Psychosis vs the Parka and Chavo vs Dragon were exactly what you'd expect. Hennig vs Smith and the tag match involving the Steiner brothers weren't too hot, and the main event was a letdown in my opinion. The ending was interesting and pretty important too in regards to the NWO, but from bell to bell it kinda felt like you were just waiting for the show to end. As a complete package, it comes off as another average pay per view though. It's another case of picking and choosing which matches to watch and you won't feel bad at all for missing the others because there isn't a whole lot to see. Nitro on Monday should be an interesting one though. The New World Order's in desperate need of a change up if Eric Bischoff's hell bent on keeping his money train going throughout 1998. So join me for the next episode of Reliving the War and we'll see what happens. Thanks for watching this one guys, I hope you enjoyed it and take care.